our, our journey from here in the States to, to becoming full-time missionaries to Nicaragua. When that process took place, we had a lot of emotions come up into our head, and the biggest one for me was fear, right? We're all scared of stuff, right? How many of you here are scared of spiders? Anybody here just absolutely scared of spiders? Yeah. I don't mind spiders as much, but my wife, man, she is very scared of spiders. You know, I have to always step on them. Right? But I'm not even talking about that kind of fear. We have other fears in life. Maybe it's the fear of change. Maybe it's the fear of failure. But so many times we allow fear to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. And that fear in our life uh, comes and it almost paralyzes us. And with me, when God called us to go to Nicaragua, man, I was scared. I had fear. And this verse kept coming up over and over and over in my head. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy 1.7. This verse right here kept coming up into my head over and over again, and it's this verse. Many of you probably know this verse. It's this, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isn't that cool to know that fear doesn't come from the Lord, right? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And here's the thing, God calls us to do things, and so many times we allow fear to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. It reminds me of the story I read uh, the other day in a, a magazine. I like to read like those popular science magazines, just I, that stuff interests me, but I came across this story about a, a scientist who owned a bunch of monkeys, right? And you automatically know this is going to be a great story, right? Because this, there's a, a guy who owns a bunch of monkeys, it's got to be good. So I start reading the story, and it's this story about this guy who has these monkeys. He puts all these monkeys in this room, and in the center of this room is this giant stock with a big bunch of bananas on top. So he's watching these monkeys. These monkeys look up. They see the bananas. One monkey decides to climb up and grab the bananas. So he starts climbing up this tree, and this guy takes this water hose and just blasts this monkey with ice-cold water. <laughs> right? He slides down the tree, runs. So what this guy does, he starts coming in, he takes out a monkey, and he puts a brand new monkey in the room. This brand new monkey's never been in the room before, but he sees the bananas, he sees the other monkeys, and he's got to be thinking, why aren't they getting the bananas? So he starts to climb the tree. So he starts climbing this tree, and one of these monkeys reach out, grab his ankle, and pull him down. He looks at him, (laughs) right? All right, I won't do it again. (laughs) Looks at him, looks at the bananas, looks back at the monkey and tries to go up again. He pulls him down again, finally gives up. What was interesting is this this scientist, he, he replaced every single monkey in the room until there was all new monkeys in the room. None of the monkeys have ever been sprayed with water, but for some reason, every single monkey was scared to climb up this tree and they had no idea why. And here's the thing that it it got going in my head was, this reminded me of me and us because so many times we allow other people's fears, other people's failures to hold us back from doing what God has called us to do. We allow those fears to stop us. Sometimes we don't even know what we're scared of. But here's what I wanted to kind of talk to you about today is this, don't let fear make a monkey out of you. We're going to look at our Bible today in Judges chapter 6. It's this story, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible of this man named Gideon. We're going to start in verse 1. Judges 6, verse 1 and 2, we see Gideon for the first time. Uh, Gideon was this man, he, if you don't know who Gideon was, we're going to get to that. He wasn't the guy who stayed at the hotel before he left his Bible in the drawer. Uh, Gideon was a man who was raised in a culture of fear. In Gideon's day, uh, the Israelites had done evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord allowed the Midianites to come over and overwhelm the, the, the Israelites. They had come in there, and we'll look at verse 1 of Judges chapter 6. It says this, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountain caves and strongholds. See, these guys were scared. They were scared of the Midianites. Gideon was raised in this culture of fear. He grew up in this. He was hiding. Um, Every time he turned around, he was hiding. Look at verse 11 and 12. It says this. 
This is where we see Gideon for the first time. It says, And there came an angel of the Lord, and he sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joaz the Abysserite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. That had to be a funny sight. A winepress is this, this deep cave type thing, and he was doing a job that should have been done outside. He had to look like a fool. I mean, just picture this, covered head to toe in, in wheat shaft. This, this stuff, he, he was dirty, he looked silly, he looked foolish. And here he is, and it says in verse 12, And an angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said this, he said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Something so opposite, something that Gideon had probably never heard in his life. Being called a mighty warrior. And he's thinking, man, I look like a fool. He's probably thinking, hey, you got the wrong guy, right? The Lord comes to him and he says this. He says, the Lord is with thee, mighty man of valor. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go in and I want you to take down the Midianites with your hand. And when God said this to him, immediately insecurities rose up in Gideon. And I think so many times we share some of these insecurities with Gideon. He calls him this mighty warrior, this mighty man of God, this mighty man of valor. He was calling him to be the savior, the judge for the Israel, Israelites. And the first insecurity that rose up in Gideon was this. Gideon was afraid that God wasn't faithful. First thing, Gideon was afraid that God wasn't faithful. Look at verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all of his miracles which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the many nights. He's saying, God, if you're really with me, where are you? Where are the, where's the God from the stories my grandpa used to tell me about the Israelites coming out of Egypt? Where's that God? Why are we dealing with this situation? I think so many times when we feel like God is calling us to something, when God has called you to something bigger than yourself, we immediately have this thing, well, God, I'm scared you're not going to be with me. What if, you don't, what if you're not following me through on this? Why, if you're calling me to this, am I dealing with all these problems in my life? Why am I dealing with this sickness? Why am I dealing with this pain? Why am I dealing with this relationship that's broken? Where are you in all of this? Where's the God of my past? Where's the God of the Bible. We feel like that sometimes, like God's not faithful, and that's what Gideon was feeling. The second thing, insecurity that Gideon had, was Gideon was afraid he wasn't strong enough. Look at verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He's saying, listen, God, my family, they have issues. Right, don't we feel like that sometimes? My family, they have issues, and I am the least in my family. How am I going to save Israel? I'm not good enough. And this comes up so much in our lives as well. When God calls you to do something, oh, I can't do that. I can't sing. I only sing in the shower. Nobody wants to hear that. I can't go across, I can't talk to those people about God. What if they make fun of me. What if it doesn't work? What if they get mad at me? What if they don't want to be my friends more? What is my family going to think of me if I take this step of faith? I'm not good enough. I can't do it. Gideon was afraid he wasn't strong enough. Let me ask you this question today. What has fear kept you from doing that God has called you to do? What in your life right now has fear kept you from doing that God has called you to do? Because if there's something that you can answer that with today, maybe today God wants to do the Gideon in your life. You're thinking, what's the Gideon? The Gideon is this. When God uses an unsure, insecure, and fearful person to do the impossible. That's what the Gideon is. When God uses an unsure, insecure, and fearful person to do the impossible, that is God's M.O., Look throughout scripture, we see God using fearful people, unsure, insecure people to do big things. Think about Moses. Moses had a speech impediment a lot of people think. What did God call him to do? To be the mouthpiece of Israel. I guarantee you he was insecure about doing that. He even said, send somebody else. Think about David. Teenage boys. Man, teenagers, They're insecure, they're unsure, they're fearful, but what did God use them to do? He used them to defeat Goliath. He anointed them to be the next king of Israel. 
God uses unsure, insecure, and fearful people to do the impossible. The first thing that we're going to look at, we're going to look at, if we're going to kind of finish this story real quick, and we're going to just pull out a couple truths from this story is this. The first truth is this, I want you all to see in verse 14. It says, with God, his strength through your weakness is exactly enough. When God calls you to something, his strength through your weakness is exactly enough. Look at verse 14. It says this, and the Lord looked upon Gideon and said this, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the many knights. I love this part. I have it underlined, highlighted in my Bible. Have not I sent thee. I love that. Have not I sent thee, God said. With God, his strength through my weakness is exactly enough, exactly what I need to get the job done. It reminds me of high school. I remember uh, ninth grade year is an awkward year in high school, right? Can we agree that being a freshman is an awkward time in life? Um, I remember my freshman year uh, very vividly. Um, I remember coming from eighth grade thinking I was just the bomb. I thought I was awesome. I thought I was cool. I thought I knew everything. I remember going into ninth grade year, freshman year, thinking, man, I'm going to be the most popular kid in school. I'm awesome. Man, how was, was I wrong, right? I remember that first week of school. I, I walked into high school. Uh, I saw this girl. And I thought she was cute. She was like 11th grade girl, and I thought, I'm going to ask her out, right? So I walked up with all my swag going on, and, and I probably said some cheesy pickup line, and she looked at me, and she tore me to pieces. I mean, she told me every single reason why she would never even notice me. I mean, on and on, and just crushed my soul. But what was even worse than that was I found out later she had a boyfriend, and he was the biggest guy on the football team. And no joke, for the rest of my ninth grade year, he made it his goal in life to make my life miserable. Everywhere I went, this guy would turn his class ring around and pop me in the back of the head or, or threaten to beat me up. I mean, I was scared. Everywhere I went, I was hiding. I mean, I was, if he was down the same hall, I'd go the other way, even if I knew I was going to be late for class. I mean, I was scared. But then there were some rumors about some kids who were transferring over from another school. There's this one guy named Mike. Mike had been to prison before. Mike had killed a man, and he carried this giant club around. I mean, I don't know if those were true, but that's what we heard. (laughs) But guess who was my new best friend? That's right, Mike. Man, me and Mike were like that. We were close. We were best friends. We started hanging out. And you know what? I wasn't scared anymore. You know why? Because I'm with Mike. (laughs) Right? I walk into football practice. I'm with Mike. Walk down the hall. I'm with Mike. Nobody mess with me because I'm with Mike. I'm with God. Right? I'm with God. When God calls you to do something that you know you can't do, won't he be right there with you through it? Look what he said to Gideon. Have not I sent thee? Our weakness is an amazing conduit for God's strength. Look at verse 16. Judges chapter 6 says, And the Lord said said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. One man. So Gideon had God, God with him. He he said, Okay, fine, let's do this. And so he starts to recruit this army. And he starts doing a good job. And we start reading this, and you see, he gets together about a group of 32,000 men. And you think, Well, that's that's, that's great. 32,000 men, that's awesome. He gets this group of men together, and we see in verse uh, 7, it says this, it says, the first part of verse 7, it says, and the Lord said unto Gideon, I mean, chapter 7, verse 2, it says, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. I can imagine Gideon's face. God said, listen, you have too many people. Gideon's thinking, listen, I don't have enough people. I have 32,000 people. The Midianites have about 200,000 people in their army. I need more people. And God said, no, you have too many people. And he says, all right. He says, what I do? He says this in the rest of verse 2 and 3. It says, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of all the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000 and remained 10,000. Imagine that as Gideon. He's probably thinking, oh, these are my people. We're not scared. 
It'll be good. I could go up there. I could tell him to leave. Walks up, says, anybody who's scared, leave. 22,000 men turned around and went home to their mamas. Scared. Left 10,000 people there. Gideon said, okay, we have 10,000 people there. We can do this. God's with us. And that brings us to our next truth is this, or our final truth is this. With God, the way forward is often backwards. With God, the way forward is often backwards. Look what else happens in this. And it's like with Gideon, it feels like every step forward he takes, he's taking two steps back. In verse um, well, here, so the way forward is often backwards. So Gideon, he has 10,000 men left, and God says, you still have too many men. I can just picture Gideon's jaw. Oh, what? Right? He goes, this is what I want you to I want you to take them down to the river. The guys who get down like this and drink with their hands, he said, those guys keep them. He goes, but the men who get down on all fours and stick their tongue in water like a dog, he said, send those guys home. Right? Because that's gross. Let's get those guys out of here. So Gideon does this, and check out what happens. He's left with 300 men. 300 men. In Gideon's mind, picture what you would be feeling. It's like every step forward he took, it was two steps back. Have we ever felt like that in life? Like every step forward I take, there's three steps back. I don't know about you, but uh, we have three young kids, and raising kids feels just like that. Right? Every step forward you take, it's like four steps back. Potty training, oh my goodness. I mean, you think, how do you not understand? I'm not going to get into it. (laughs) But it's like with kids, right? Every step forward feels like three steps back. Maybe it's a relationship in your life that you feel like you're just moving backwards and you're trying to do what God wants you to do, but every time you get some traction, you feel like you're pushed backwards. With God, the way forward is often backwards. Those things that often feel like a setback, are often God setting us up for something big. I like to think of like a slingshot, right? In order for me to take this slingshot and shoot all the way back that way, what I gotta do, I gotta pull that rock back. And I think that's what God does. He sets us up for these big things. We see this throughout scripture, right? Joseph, think about Joseph's life, a life of setbacks. Right? His brother sold him to slavery. He built his way up in Potiphar's house, get accused of something he didn't do, back into jail. He's in jail. He gets out. He gets back to jail. He, people forget about him. Setback after setback after setback. But God was really setting him up for something big. And maybe in your life right now, you feel like God, with God, doing what he wants you to do, every time you move forward, there's like four steps back. And you feel like you're moving backwards or not gaining any traction. Maybe it's because God is setting you up for something big. I love the rest of this story with Gideon. Gideon gets his 300 men together and say, okay, it's time to go. He gets his 300 men together and he says, here's the plan, and I like to picture it like this. I like to picture he pulls his giant trunk in, and he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We got some equipment. I think everybody, 300 men are like, yeah, we're going to get some new weapons, get some new swords, some new armor, shields. It's going to be great. Getting, oh, here it is, and he pulls out a tea pitcher, a clay pitcher like you put sweet tea in, right? And he goes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to smash it. And then we're going to do this. And he pulls something out. He pulls out a trumpet. And I bet everybody is thinking, what is the band class, right? Then we're going, to, we're going to blow the trumpet. And then he reached out and he pulled out a candle, like a torch. He said, we're going to hold these up in the air and we're just going to scream. But we see something with these people, these 300 men. See, they had something. They, they were the the crop of the crop, right? The rest of them had left 300 men who understood God and knew that God was in in control and knew that they weren't strong enough to do this by themselves, but that God would have to work through them. So what do these 300 men do? They surrounded the Midianites' camp in the middle of the night. They took those glass pitchers and they smashed them on the ground. They blew the trumpet and they hold up the torch and they all scream. And what we see next is so amazing. God takes over. These men realized they couldn't do it on their own, but God said, I got it. And the Midianites came out of their camp and they started attacking one another, destroying themselves. And God moved. And see, so many times in our life, I think 
We think we can do it on our own. We don't need help. We got it. See, we come from a long line of fixers. All the way back to Adam and Eve, right? Eve and Adam, they sinned, ate the fruit. God comes in and says, why are you naked? He goes, oh, you know, this is, why are you covered up? Why are you wearing fig leaves? And Adam's thinking, this is the new style, right? See, they try to fix it. They try to cover up themselves. We come from a long line of fixers. I think about uh, Chuck E. Cheese. You all have Chuck E. Cheese here in Ohio? I love Chuck E. Cheese. A lot more as a kid than I do as an adult with kids. Now it kind of stresses me out, but it's still fun. But as a kid, Chuck E. Cheese was the jam, right? I mean, it was the place to be. I remember going, they had those, those ball pits. I love the, my favorite thing ever was the uh, uh, ski ball, right? I love ski ball. I always thought, why as adults don't we have like a ski ball league? Like a church ski ball league? You come into Chuck E. Cheese, you're like, scoot over, kid. It's league night, right? <laughs> like, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. But I remember Chuck E. Cheese. My favorite thing about Chuck E. Cheese as a kid was our Chuck E. Cheese had this ice cream bar. And you could go up and it was just, it was like heaven for a, an eight-year-old boy, right? My mom and dad would let me get whatever I wanted. So I'd go and we'd get these big bowls of ice cream and just fill it up with this soft serve white, pure vanilla ice cream. It was amazing. But the best thing about the ice cream bar was the sprinkles, I don't know why I don't like sprinkles now, but as a kid, sprinkles were like drugs. I mean, they were, I couldn't get enough. I mean, I was hoarding them, putting them in my pocket, taking sprinkles home. I love sprinkles, but at Chuck E. Cheese, you could get unlimited amount of sprinkles. And I remember this one time I was in line, we got our ice cream, there's this older boy in front of me, and we're going to get sprinkles next, and he pushed this button, and the sprinkles came out, it's amazing. And this kid comes up, and he's kind of bragging, acting all cool, and uh, he pushes this thing, and he turns it out pushing the wrong thing. Instead of sprinkles coming out into his ice cream, this bright yellow mustard just <laughs> all over his ice cream. I remember thinking, as a kid, this was so devastating. What is he going to do? Thankfully, there's a Chuck E. Cheese employee right there. He comes up and he goes, here, let me get you a new bowl. I remember, like it was yesterday, this kid looked at the guy, looked at his ice cream, looked at the guy, took his spoon, and he goes, nah, it's all right. And he starts to stir <laughs> in the mustard. So what was once bright white ice cream and bright yellow mustard starts to combine into this dull brown mush. And let's face it, mustard's not a shy condiment, right? Mustard kind of busts the door down and says, boom, I'm mustard. I mean, it's there, it's loud. And this guy's mixing it. And it made me think, how many times in our life do we have a mess in our own life? And instead of getting a new bowl from God, getting help from God, we say, you know what, I got it. And we start to stir and try to fix everything ourselves. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of things worse than mustard in my bowl. I got like car oil and a dead bird in there. I mean, it's bad. But here's the thing. When we try to fix our lives, when we do this ourselves, no amount of stirring, no amount of good deeds, no amount of, of, of trying to do it ourselves is going to be good enough. We can't get to heaven on our own. We can't make ourselves right. We are sinners. We have that. Our lives are messed up. But let me tell you this. I am so thankful that I serve a God who came for the broken bowls of this world. Right? What did God do for us? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for my mess. And now I don't have to fix it myself. I don't have to try to be good enough because I will never be good enough. But Jesus Christ came and he died on a cross he became sin for us. And when we believe in him, when we follow him, when we decide to take that step of faith and follow him, man, he gives us a brand new life. He makes us a new creation. He gives us a brand new bowl of bright white ice cream. So let me ask you this again, and then I'm done, is this. What has fear kept you from doing in your life that God has called you to do? What is it? What does fear stop you from doing that God has called you to do? If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes with me.
nobody looking around, everybody head bowed and eyes closed. I just, I just want to say, if there's somebody in here today who has let fear stop them from following through on what God has placed in your heart, maybe it's a, a passion of yours that God says, I want you to turn that into a ministry of some kind but you've been too scared to take the step. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that needs to be fixed, but let, you've let fear stop you from doing that. Maybe you felt like God has been calling you to follow him, and you've been too scared to take that step of faith. Maybe you've been in church, and you know these things about God, but yet you don't have a relationship with him. You've been trying to do it on your own. Maybe today, you need to allow God to step in and do something. 